So hi everyone, I'm Lynn Clark and I make code cartoons. And I also work for Mozilla uh, and I work on a browser there but not the browser that you might think that I work on. I'm actually working on a new browser with some other folks. It's a new experimental browser called Project Tofino and it's built in part with React. Uh, so if you wanna learn more about that, uh, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards because it's an early project. I'm not talking about today. Instead, today, I'm talking about performance and React. And I should start by saying I'm not going to be telling you anything that you haven't already heard. I may be talking about things like keys and should component update and immutability. The reason I wanted to talk about them today here, though, is because I think that often we have a fuzzy understanding of the concepts around performance. At least I know I did. We don't take the time to bring these concepts into focus. And this means that we treat the knowledge that we get about these, the recommendations, as received knowledge. And we just follow those recommendations because someone smarter than us told us to. Somebody standing on a stage who we think is smarter than us because they're talking at us like this. But not all recommendations work the same in different situations. So I want to bring these concepts around performance into focus so you have a better understanding of the why behind each recommendation. And I should say I'm fo focusing on a very specific part of performance in React. I'm focusing on the performance of the render cycle, uh, not on things like using the production build of React in production. Those are also important, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. So this talk's gonna go a little something like this. I'm gonna first cover the basics of rendering in the browser and what can be slow there. And then I'm gonna talk about how React minimizes and batches DOM changes to make it a little bit faster using the virtual DOM. And then I'm gonna talk about what on top of those defaults you can do to make React faster. So let's start with number one, how the browser builds your web page. And you can think of this process kind of in the same way that you think of building how you develop your web page. There's work that takes place over time and there's an initial period. In React, that's the initial render. For you, it would be the initial launch. And that's usually gonna be longer than something, you know, one of these updates, whether that's a feature update to your site or an update in React. To extend this metaphor, your code is kind of like the project lead on this project. It's planning the project and telling folks what to do. Unfortunately for your code, it only has one worker who's actually doing the work on this project, and that's the main thread. So the main thread is kind of like a full stack developer. The main thread's in charge of JavaScript, the DOM, and layout. And just as when you're working on a project in real life and you only have one person doing the actual work, if you wanna deliver quickly, you're gonna need to minimize, you're gonna need to reduce the amount of tasks that you load onto this one worker. But before we know how to reduce the amount of work that the main thread is doing, we need to know more about what that work is. So as I mentioned before, the main thread is in charge of JavaScript, the DOM, and layout. So JavaScript, you know, that's where your code lives. That's where you define functions and call functions. The DOM is the way that those functions can tell the page what to do. So basically the DOM gives you a set of objects that you can move around and manipulate in order to get the browser to change the page. And the way that this works is that, the, is that there's something behind the scenes called the render tree. So the main thread combines the DOM and CSS to create the render tree. And then it figures out a thing from there called the box model which hands off to the thing that paints the pixels on the screen for the page. And this process is called a reflow. And that computation, it takes a bit of time. So the main thread doesn't do it every time the DOM changes. If it would, it'd be spending most of its time in layout. Instead what it tries to do is batch as many of these changes as possible into a single reflow. So let's say that our code wants to change a class name on a button. It would tell the main thread to do that. Main thread would go over and change the, the class name. And then we want to add a div, and then another button. So the main thread would keep making these changes to the DOM tree, but, but it wouldn't recalculate the render tree with each change. Instead, it would wait for a scheduled reflow and then recalculate them all together. So we wanna reduce the amount of work that this main thread has to do. 
You might have figured out two possible ways to do this. One would be to minimize the number of times we send it over to that DOM tree, the number of changes we make to this DOM tree. And another would be to batch those changes in time so that they catch the same reflow. So these are some things that React helps you do. And I wanna be clear, React is not the only way to do this. These have been part of best practices in web development since before React. So you can get as good or even sometimes better performance with vanilla JS as you can with React. The thing is though, in order to get that performance, your code has to be smart. Your code needs to know how to direct the main thread pretty precisely. To go back to the metaphor, your code needs to be both a really, really good product manager, so it needs to know what your team should be shipping, and also be, needs to be a really, really good tech lead. It needs to know the most efficient way to direct the main thread in shipping. Of course, your code is only as smart as you make it. So it means that all of the developers on your team have to have a really, really solid grasp of all of these concepts and also not be prone to making mistakes. What React does for you is it offloads that work. So I think of it kind of like your code hires a consultant tech lead to actually do all of that tech lead work. And this frees up your code just to be a good product manager so it can focus on just what needs to be displayed, not on how the work happens. So let's take a look at how these two, React and your code, work together to direct the main thread. And I'm not gonna be showing the main thread through the rest of the slides, but you can assume wherever work is happening here, the main thread is doing it. So this brings us to part two, minimizing and batching the DOM changes using the virtual DOM. So we'll start with a web page that your team is gonna be building. It's just a button with a list. And when you click the button, it's going to square this value. So let's walk through the initial render. And I'm gonna start from the very beginning. A user has downloaded the page, parsed the HTML, uh, and there's at least one HTML element that the React app is gonna be inserted into. This is called the container. And at this point, React has been loaded and so is your code, including components, which are basically deputy product managers. They know about what specific parts of the page should display. And this is the code we're looking at, if that didn't sound familiar. Um, it's react dom dot render, and then you pass in the react element, list in this case, and the container that you want to render the HTML element, um, or that you want to render into, which is the HTML element. So we've already talked about that container, but what is this react element? So, what's an element? It's a way for your code to hand off requirements to react to follow this analogy that we have going. So it's kind of like a little note card that has a few notes about what React needs to build. It has the type, which is the component that's going to be used, and it has the props and children. And React's gonna hold on to this element. It's gonna hold on to this note card and just kind of tuck it away until it needs it, until it's ready to build what it needs to build. And what it builds using this note card, using these requirements, is an instance of the component. So this is the thing that holds on to the state and the refs and everything and when you call this.setState, you're, you're interacting with that instance, but you don't actually have to create that instance because React actually manages the instance. And it's what React uses to figure out what DOM nodes it needs to change and actually manage those changes. So your code asks for an element, and React creates it. Then your code tells React to start rendering that element into the container. And this begins the construction of that tree. Now, if you don't follow, because I'm gonna have to move pretty quickly through this, if you don't follow the algorithm, um, this is being recorded so you can watch it again. And if you want to see this diagram in a zoomable way, um, check out on Twitter, I've posted it on Lynn Clark or Code Cartoons, you can find this diagram there too. And I should note here, um, this algorithm has actually changed since I started writing this talk, and it is gonna change again. Um, so some of the things that I'm talking about here might not be true in a few months, but for right now, they are. So React starts by creating the top level wrapper, and this is one of those things that's probably gonna change soon. Um, it starts by creating this thing called the top level wrapper, which is just a little implementation detail. Um, so it creates the element for that, and then it creates an instance. And it's hooked up, the top level wrapper, to render to the list element that you passed in. So it creates an instance of the list. And it sets the properties and state on that instance. And then it wants to create the corresponding DOM for that. But it doesn't know how. 
If this were an internal component that React defined, something like a div, then it would know how to create the corresponding DOM. But since it doesn't, it's gonna have to ask the component. And so the list says, I need a button, and take this.state.items, and for each item in that array, create an item element, and then wrap all of that with a div element. So React creates those elements and just kind of tucks them away until it needs them. It doesn't care that it doesn't know what the DOM interactions for the item element are. It's just gonna tuck those note cards away until it needs to ask. And so it pulls out the div. That was that wrapping div. It pulls that out and starts instantiating that because that's gonna be the parent of the others. So it creates an instance, and because it knows what DOM it needs to create for the div, it goes over to the DOM and creates it. Now note, it did not make it a child of the app container because that would have scheduled that reflow. It's gonna wait until it has all of the DOM nodes it needs. So now it needs to create instances for all of the children. And for this, it's gonna go from a complex data structure to a simple data structure. So it's gonna take this nested array of children and flatten it, turn it into a flat object. And the names of the, the property names in this object are going to correspond to the structure of that more complex nested array. So dot zero is gonna be the name for button because it was the zeroth element of that array. For items, there's a more complex name because items are nested. So you have dot one, dot zero for the first item. And we'll get back to the importance of these names later. So React takes this flattened list and creates the instances for all of these things. And now it's time to make the DOM nodes for those things. So button's easy. It's an internally defined component, so React knows how to build out the DOM for that. Then it gets to the first item, and it doesn't know what to create for that, so it has to ask. An item tells it, okay, create a div element, and use the prop that was passed in as the text content for that. And so React creates the div element, and the instance, and again, it knows what a div is, so it goes over to the DOM and creates the div. And then it does this two more times to create the full set of DOM nodes. And it's at this point that it goes over to the DOM and connects those children up to their parent wrapping div, and then connects that parent wrapping div up to the app container, and this is what schedules that reflow. So this makes it, you know, this is that batching, that this is, um, something that React does to reduce the amount of work that the main thread has to do by, by scheduling this all together. And so we get our UI, and that's the initial render. At this point, the UI is ready for the user. So now let's see what happens when the user actually does click on something. So what happens here? React figures out the on-click handler for the click, and it uses something called event delegation for this. I don't have uh, too much time to go into event delegation, but there is an explanation in the docs. So it finds the handler and calls the handler. And the handler would be code like this. You know, you get a list of items from the state, perform operations on the items, then call set state with the items. If you think you see a possible bug here, we're gonna get to that later. So the handler would have been defined on the list instance, and we would have bound that handler to that list instance. So when we call this.setState, we're actually calling that on that list instance. So what happens when setState is called? It doesn't immediately handle the state change. Instead it takes the partial state that was passed in and adds it to a list on the instance of things that are gonna need to change. And then it takes this instance and puts it on another list called the dirty components array. And it's just gonna let that sit there for a while while it figures out if there have been other changes made that it's gonna to need to take care of as part of this click handler. And then once it's checked and queued up all of those changes, it's going to come back and flush that queue. So we start processing these changes. Now we only have one instance in the dirty components right here, so we're just gonna process this one. We start the, with the instance that had set state called and work down from there. And I'm gonna turn everything else gray, all of the stuff that we did in the initial render gray. React does hold on to these so that it can do comparisons between the previous and the next. So React calculates the next state and props and sets them on the instance. And then asks the list instance what it should render to now. 
and it creates those elements. And then it updates the children instances, compares the previous instances of those children to the next ones, and figures out whether or not it needs to make DOM changes. So of course the button didn't change, so it doesn't need to do anything for that. It gets to that first item and has to ask again what the item renders to. And so it updates the div instance for item one. Since that didn't change, it figures it can save a little work. It doesn't actually even need to go over to the DOM. It doesn't need to make that DOM change. And now we get to the second item. And React updates the instance and realizes that these actually do have different text content values. So it goes over and makes the change to that text content. And then it goes through the process again for the third. And because these two changes happened in quick succession, they probably were handled in the same reflow. So that's how React makes things faster. It figures out the smallest number of changes that it needs to make to the DOM and batches them together so that the browser can do a smaller number of reflows. But there's still a good amount of work happening here. How can we reduce this? And that brings us to the third part of the talk, which is what techniques you can use to make React even faster. And the first technique is one that you probably already know, because React tells you. Whenever you're creating an array of children using something like map, it's gonna tell you that you should be using keys for those children. So I wanna show you why this helps. And I'm gonna change up my example to something that really highlights this. So you have an, a list of fruits, they're in alphabetical order. And when you click the button, they go in reverse alphabetical order. So we're in the set state process. We've clicked the button, we've gotten to the set state process. And we've gotten to this point, which is where it starts to get interesting. This is where it starts dealing with the children. And so if you remember, this is where it was flattening from that uh, child structure that was coming from the element into the flat object and giving names to each of these children. And from there, it updated the instances of the children by comparing them. So let's see what it looks like, this comparison between the old and the new looks like. So it's going to compare these items based on the name. So it's gonna compare dot one dot zero to dot one dot zero and the next and the previous. But that name was built up using the indexes in the array. And of course we've reversed the order of those array items. So that means it's comparing apples to oranges, quite literally in this case. Apple was at position zero before and now oranges. So when it compares these two lists, it needs to think, it thinks that it needs to update the values of all of the items except for the middle one because they all look different than they used to. Now let's say that we had given React meaningful keys for all of these children. Something like the fruit name. The key would be used in the, in the property name. So it would be dot one dollar sign apple. Then React can tell which of the previous instances corresponds to which of the next ones. And it can actually reach down and pull out the right one to compare. And it sees that nothing has changed but the order of these. So it knows it can just go over to the DOM and reorder those nodes. In this case, it's not a huge difference. The amount of work for those two isn't a huge difference. But just imagine if each of these items were a complex DOM structure in and of itself. This could be a real time savings. But it's only really gonna be a time savings if you are reordering this list. You know, if you're actually reversing the order or taking something off the top of the list. Otherwise, you're not gonna see a real performance difference here. And this is one of the reasons it's important to understand the why behind the recommendation, because recommendations don't always have the same impact across different use cases. So let's look at another use case where keys wouldn't have so much of an effect, but something else would. It's a list where new items are being fetched from a server and added to the end of the list. So it's fetched, but there are no new messages. So React's gonna go through the process of building out the render tree, creating the elements and updating instances, even though nothing needs to change in the DOM. And this is called wasted time. So you can see this in React perf tools. You can actually see your wasted time. How can you avoid wasting time like this? I'm sure you've heard of one way, which is should component update. The way this works is when the user clicks and this.setState is called, 
before building up the render tree below the list, React will ask the component a question. It'll say, if I give you these next props in this next state, do you need to update? And if the component says no, then React doesn't call render and doesn't do anything else to that component or its children. And this is great because we can skip computing the list and everything under it. So we save a good amount of work. But if you were looking closely at this should component update, you might have noticed a potential bug. And this ties into that other potential bug that I talked about earlier when we were looking at the click handler. It depends on how you're updating the state. So let's say you're updating it this way. You set a new variable, next items, to this.state.items, uh, this .state and you push a new item on the array, and then call set state with the new variable. What would happen here is that you'd never see the new items. Your should component update would always return false. Why is this? <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's because even though you have two names for this thing, they're both pointing to the same thing. So they're equal. Um, and when you do an equals check in JavaScript, it's gonna just see if they refer to the same thing. So even if you make this change, the should component update is gonna think that the old state and the new state are the same. So it's not gonna see the change. You could make it so that next state is its own object, and then your should component update would see that the previous item variable points to a different object than the next. But the problem is, it would always think that something had changed, even when it hadn't. It would never return false, so your should component update wouldn't save any time here. Now you could do a deep equality check, where you compare the actual values of these. But depending on how heavy that is, you might actually end up spending more time rather than less, because should component update gets called reasonably frequently. So it would be nice to have the simple quick equals check but still catch changes to the data. And this is what immutability gives you in this case. With immutable data, if two variables are pointing to the same object, you know that that data hasn't changed. If it does need to change, you create a new object. So if you're using immutable data, then you can do these quick equality checks in your should component update and keep that fast. So with should component update, using uh, immutable data uh, very possibly, you can short circuit work lower in the tree. But what if the change happens in one of the children? Do you still need to compute this whole tree? So let's walk through that case. We have a to-do list and we check off one of the items. So the item changes, but the other items, its siblings, they don't really change and the list itself doesn't really change either. So can we reduce the amount of work we have to do here by not doing anything for those items? You can, and when you're using uh, vanilla React with local component state, it can be pretty easy. Because you can just restructure your state so that you can call set state lower in the tree. But when you're using something like Redux, it's not as obvious how you can do this. That's because you're firing off actions and then the state is coming in through connect which is usually at the top of the tree. However, there is a way to do it, and that's actually by connecting items lower in the tree. Now, this is something that you'll wanna test what uh, performance impact it has before you actually, because you might need to rethink the way that you handle your data for this to work, and so you'll actually wanna test it out and see if it gives you the performance impact that you think it will. But the way that you would need to restructure your data in this case you know, you'd have a component structure like this. Most of the time, people would pass the items in as an array into the list, and then pass those down into the item elements. Well, when you need to change an item, you don't just change that item, but because we're doing things immutably, you're changing that array as well. So that's gonna trigger that update at the list level. You can actually handle this, though. What you can do is pass in IDs, because those IDs aren't gonna change. And then, in your map state to props, you can go from ID to item. And this will make it so that when you need to change that last item, only it sees the update. 
So this is how you can save work at higher levels of the tree and sibling levels of the tree. I wish I had time to cover, cover other concepts and tricks around performance, um, things like memoization and virtualization. Uh, I wish I had time to talk about the new algorithm that's being worked at, at Facebook. Um, or observables, like uh, Dan was talking about, Redux observable or like Relay uses. Um, but this is going to have to be it for now. So to cover again what we talked about, um, you know, you can use keys to help React match previous instances to new ones. You can use should component update to short circuit work lower in the tree, below where you're calling set state. And immutability can factor into that. And then you can use set state or connect lower in the tree to reduce the amount of work that you have to do above it. So I hope this has given you a good idea of a few starting points. As you can see, there are lots of tweaks you can make. Um, some of them are right for certain cases, some of them for others, and some might actually have negative impacts if you use them in the wrong way in the wrong use case. This is why people say to measure. When you're doing performance things, you should be measuring what you're doing. And hopefully this talk has given you a good framework for understanding what you're measuring. Thank you.